Pilon fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5, slides by Dr. Michael Leslie. I'm Saka Rahman narrating. Goals of this lecture are to go through the patient characteristics of Pilon fractures, their radiographic interpretation, classification, emergent care, acute versus delayed definitive care, definitive stabilization, postoperative care, and outcomes. So demographics, pilon fractures are 3 to 10% of tibial fractures, and they're 1% of all fractures, usually around uh, 30 to 40 years of age, uh, with a predilection for males. Uh, and these occur with falls, motor vehicle collisions, motorcycle collisions. And uh, it's worth noting that there are uh, particular patient risk factors for infection. These are cases that uh, are sort of plagued by uh, complication and, and uh, poor outcomes, and some of those are related to infection. So patient age, diabetes, obesity, urinary incontinence, malnutrition, neurologic deficits, MRSA, uh, staph colonization, uh, patients who are having revision surgery, uh, NSAIDs, and um, blood transfusions. The other thing to keep in mind is things under your control, like uh, prolonged surgical time, uh, can also play a role. So um, if you have multiple comorbidities, uh, that can also increase your risk for infection, uh, so multiple medical comorbidities. Now, uh, these occur in somewhat two varieties, low energy and high energy mechanisms. You have the so-called... Uh, a tibial pilon or plafond injury that occurs with low energy injuries, so a twisting mechanism um, without real impaction. So you have intraarticular involvement, but not really impaction of the articular surface. And that's going to be sort of transition points from malleole or ankle fractures to pilon fractures. Uh, these can, can occur sometimes uh, skiing um, and skateboarding injuries. Um, and oftentimes the fracture can begin extraarticular and then might go down into the articular surface and low and low risk for open fractures and uh, severe soft tissue injuries. But then we have the high energy mechanism, which is sort of the talus being driven up into the tibial plafond, uh, and you get this sort of mortar and pestle type uh, mechanism with fall from heights, violent impact like motor vehicle crashes. These are higher risk for open fractures and so this is a much more expanded zone of injury. So workup, you're going to get standard radiographs like you would for an ankle, AP, lateral, mortis views. Sometimes if you're not sure what's going on, uh, contralateral images can help. A lot of things we're going to look at on x-rays we'll go through. CT scans are definitely helpful. It's part of your preoperative planning, so you could pretty much say mandatory. Uh, you may not... Um, uh, do them immediately necessarily. Certainly if you have an open fracture and it's ready to go to the OR, uh, you may not want to wait for a CT scan. You may want to get to the OR and then as you'll see, a lot of times these are treated with external fixation so that once you have that reduction, a CT scan can maybe be a little bit more helpful. Um, 3D rendition and prints can be helpful um, for sure. It gives you just sort of that intuitive feel like a bone model of what's going on for your um, preoperative planning. Uh, but then also don't uh, don't forget about the soft tissue windows because sometimes there can be incarcerated tendons and neurovascular structures that you can better identify on your uh, axial CT scans with soft tissue windows. So here are your standard radiographs, AP, mortis, and lateral views. Uh, we'll go through some of the angles that uh, you're going to measure um, for normal anatomy. So your lateral distal tibia angle, your anatomic distal tibia angle as shown here. The uh, injury radiographs going now to abnormal anatomy uh, are really critical because they can give you a hint as uh, to you know what's going on mechanically, what might have happened at the point of impact. You may have more of a varus injury, you may have a, more of a valgus injury. You may have something where the fibula is intact uh, on the right-hand side here, and there's sort of this you know, axial load injury where, the again, the 
talus is driven up into the tibia, and you can see the fibula actually stays intact here. So this dramatic shortening there. AO classification is helpful here. Um, you know, these are 43, so you're in the distal tibia. Tibia is 4, 3 is distal. And uh, with any periarticular fracture, the A's are the extraarticular, right? So you have this sort of simple extraarticular going to the more comminuted ones in the A3s. Uh, and then you have the B's, which are partial articular, right? It means that uh, it's an articular injury, but it's not dissociated from the shaft. And then the C's are when you have all articular segments dissociated from the shaft. And you'll see some of these examples. So here's an example of a a injury. So this is really not a pilon fracture necessarily. I mean, it's not intraarticular, right? So it's a periarticular fracture, but extraarticular. So a very distal tibia fracture, but extraarticular. Here is a type B injury. So you have a partial articular fracture. So in this case, um, these are a couple of different cases, but uh, you can see that there's partial articular involvement. Um, for instance, for example, here. You can see there's anterior plafond involvement, but the posterior joint surface is still intact, more or less, to the shaft. Okay, and then you have the C-type fractures, where all the articular segments are dissociated from the shaft itself. And they come in these different varieties, as you can see here, fibular intact, fibular fractured, valgus. So, in the emergent... Uh, situation, you want to evaluate the soft tissues, you want to make sure you get a neurovascular evaluation. Of course, you want to reduce these to help improve your vascularity, help with pain control, and importantly, take pressure off the soft tissues, right? Here's a situation where you have uh, normal anatomy, the bone is right under the skin, so you put someone in a position of extreme deformity, and uh, in a short amount of time, you may develop uh, ulceration of the uh, skin tissue uh, or the soft tissue envelope, uh, which could eventually turn your closed injury into an open injury or the equivalent of one. So open fractures, of course, require soft tissue reduction. Skin can be invaginated into the fracture site. Um, these sometimes will occur with a valgus fracture pattern and open medially, as shown in the x-ray here on the right. And you have to be really careful to look for clothing and debris that might be forced into the wound. Um, of course, these need to get immediate antibiotics, um, reduce the fracture. Uh, here you can see treated with external fixation. And if there's a, you know, here's again, maybe a valgus type injury, you can see there's a medial laceration. Often they will occur a little bit transverse like this. Um, if you can, uh, do a thorough debridement and then do primary uh, closure. Um, that can help, and uh, uh, these are open fractures, or if you're going to close them, uh, drain placement is uh, advised. Um, so keep in mind also, you may not be able to easily get into these open wounds again, so take advantage of open wounds, meaning uh, if you have a fracture that you can very easily reduce and perhaps you know, fix with one or two lag screws. You know, you still need an external fixator, but this is a wound that might have a hard time healing and you may not be able to just keep opening it up again and again. So sometimes there isn't a, you can take advantage of that open wound at the initial setting and uh, fix something that might be hard to come back to later, even if you're still doing an X-fix. Of course, you follow your basic open fracture guidelines at your hospital. Um, you know, the, the problem is because you're so distal in the leg, if you can't get primary closure and you need to do something delayed, uh, you are in free flop territory for the most part. I mean, there may be some uh, exceptions, but um, just as a general rule of thumb, uh, you're not going to be able to rotate like a soleus down or something. And of course, there are potential rotational options, but um, you're distal, um, be thinking that uh, if you don't get these closed and covered, that uh, free flap coverage might be needed. Uh, negative pressure wound therapy can be used here. Uh, you do have to be careful not to desiccate the bone. And in general, um, it's not recommended you just do these back dressing changes uh, in a hospital room. It's just not going to be as sterile. 
Uh, you're more likely to introduce uh, hospital flora. Um, so again, these are open fractures. Uh, treat them as such. Uh, if you need to do a back dressing change, um, it's better that you do that in the operating room setting for sterility reasons. Bead pouch approaches um, can be used to get you high-dose antibiotics into that wound. Uh, and if you really end up with something that's going to need plastic surgery coverage, you want to get it done within a week to 10 days per um, what we understand from the most recent literature. Now, blisters, right? Fracture blisters are going to happen with these uh, in many cases. There's really no one uniform treatment algorithm. Um, if you do unroof these, um, which many people will do to help promote epithelialization, you may want to use silvadine or um, an uh, antibacterial uh, type treatment. Um, and if you have blisters, it's really not advised that you operate through them. I mean, hemorrhagic blisters are generally worse than serous blisters, but even serous blisters can compromise your surgical field. So usually if you're seeing blisters, it means you're not ready uh, to be making um, definitive operative incisions in our with surgical approaches we'll talk about a little later. So keep in mind that uh, treatment is often staged but can be acute, and there's good evidence um, to, to support both methods. Just keep in mind complications can be catastrophic, and you'll keep seeing this picture of this exposed plate with these antibiotic beads as a reminder of what can happen in areas uh, in the lower leg where you just don't have great soft tissue envelopes. So Tom Rudy and uh, Martin Algauer um, gave us our first real um, sort of extensive reports on the AO management of um, pilon fractures and uh, gave us these four tenants. And these these patients, generally speaking, I mean, they were in Switzerland, and these were patients who were generally um, skiing injuries. So as you can imagine, a little bit of a lower energy um, variety. And they came up with these four tenants, and they did um, relatively well uh, in their patient population. So first was anatomic reduction and fixation of the fibular fracture. Um, so getting the fibula out to length. Number two was anatomic restoration of the articular surface. Number three, bone grafting of the metaphyseal defect. So you'll often have this defect. And then medial buttress plating. So this was sort of their, their four um, principles for pilon fractures. Now, the North American experience that followed did have, um, you know, followed the sort of enthusiasm of the uh, the AO experience with this. And uh, unfortunately, we found higher soft tissue complications. I think we were treating more higher energy injuries. So then we sort of came up with some other options, maybe limited ORF with X-Fix, stage management with initial X-Fix, or using things like multiplanar external fixation as shown here. Uh, multiplanar external fixation is an option. Uh, in some hands, it can work very well. But in other hands, it can sometimes be prone to malunion, nonunion, uh, pin site infections when used as a definitive treatment option. So um, two papers came out, one by Serkin et al. and the other by Patterson and Cole in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, right around the same time, uh, I believe the same issue. And um, they talked about uh, staged management, so doing external fixation initially uh, and then delayed definitive internal fixation once the soft tissue is recovered. Now, this was not a completely novel concept. I mean, there are books published. Uh, Professor Heim, for example, had published a you know, book from, you know, in the European experience demonstrating that a lot of times you do have to um, do... Uh, delayed management. Uh, sometimes they'll do it with a calcaneal traction pen uh, before you go in and definitively treat pilon fractures. But nevertheless, uh, these are the um, the papers that are credited with uh, sort of changing our approach, at least in, in, in most North American centers. And that has shown to have lower uh, rates of soft tissue complications when you uh, do a staged management and then delayed internal fixation after initial X-Fix. 
So you can take fractures on the left, uh, do external fixation, uh, and you can't see the pins here. I, I can see one of the bars right here, for example. Here's another, here's another bar here. So you can see that these are after external fixation. You've gotten out to length. Uh, you've been able to improve alignment, get the talus under the um, plafond. A little bit of joint distraction here. Um, so it's basically a traction uh, to some extent, traveling traction, but one that keeps, uh, keeps your alignment uh, until you can do definitive management. So fibular ORAF on initial uh, treatment has its advantages. It improves the stability of your spanning X-fix. It allows for soft tissue recovery. Uh, maybe you get some indirect reduction of the tibial fractures via ligamentotaxis. But if you don't get it right, uh, malreduction can then adversely affect you know, your ability to get appropriate reduction of the tibia later. The other thing is, um, if your incisions aren't well placed, they can compromise your planned tibial incisions. Uh, certainly anything that may be anterolateral uh, may be compromised. Uh, sometimes you may not get length. Um, if you're doing an X-fix, as shown here, uh, X-fix pins within you know, the zone of injury here uh, can, I mean, you can have very easily egress of fracture hematoma um, and then you can imagine um, bacteria, you know, coming back in the other way uh, through that external fixator pin site right into the fracture site. So um, that is controversial to, you know, get pins in the zone of injury. Uh, many people will try to keep those out of the zone of injury uh, and, you know, site those pins way up here or even more proximal. Um, Here you can see, you know, fibular malreduction can affect um, your length. You can get um or recurvatum is shown here. Uh, that's something that could be appear well aligned on the AP radiograph, but it's really malreduced. Um, sometimes use of intramedullary fixation of the fibula, like a screw or um, a small diameter rod, can prevent that varus valgus and sagittal pain plane malreduction, although it can allow for rotational malreduction. So intramedullary fixation of the fibula is also an option. So we talked about this before. In the second stage, um, you need to pre-op plan. You'll need a CT scan. Uh, if you didn't get it initially, it, it's good to get it now. And sometimes it's more helpful to get it after that X-fix once things are out to length and your X-fix, your CT scan makes more sense. Uh, you want to look for incarcerated tendons, uh, and then you want to decide when you're going to do this. It's usually over, around two weeks. Um, you want to look for skin wrinkling. Uh, this is a little bit of surgeon preference and a little bit subjective. Um, and then you have to keep in mind that reopening traumatic wounds can be problematic. You know, you finally got these wounds to heal, and now all of a sudden you just open them back up again. So you do have to be cautious. Uh, fracture blisters. You know, when you if you're going to go back to surgery, you should wait until they re-epithelialize, um, and um, occasionally, you know, you may end up needing a flap once you go back for your definitive management. So all these things need to be taken into account when you're doing your preoperative planning. Your goals are articular reconstruction as a as a given goal, unless it's not reconstructable or the patient's not able to tolerate the incisions. And we'll show some examples of that. Uh, the metaphysis, uh, you want to reconstruct either directly or indirectly. Sometimes you will need bone grafting, like with our uh, Rudy Algauer principles we talked about earlier. So once you get your X-fix on or distraction by fibular ORF, you want to define the articular injury, uh, your fixation strategy, um, so here you can see some examples of uh, axial and coronal and sagittal CT scan images with the X-fix in place. You want to consider also 3D recons, which many times your CT scan, you don't have to go back. It's information's already there and software can provide this for you. This can be really helpful intuitively for many surgeons to just get a better sense of where the fragments are, which approaches are going to get them where, etc. So if you kind of look at um, 
pilon fractures in patients and then patient after patient map out where those fracture lines are, it's going to look something like this, right? So you sort of have these three primary primary fragments, right? You often have a fragment here, maybe a fragment here, and then a fragment here. And then you can see, you know, a lot of times in here, you may have comminution. Um, and uh, that's shown here. So you have a medial malleolar fragment, you have an anterolateral fragment, posterolateral fragment. Those are sort of your main fragments. It doesn't have to look like that, but this is a common fracture pattern you will see with many pilon fractures. So with the metaphyseal fracture reduction, um, you may want to consider direct or in some cases indirect reduction. So with a simple fracture, you may want to consider direct reduction you know, of these fracture lines here. Whereas you know, with a metaphyseal fracture like this, um, you may be relying more on indirect reduction methods. So think about your reduction methods when you're preoperative planning these. So... The joint surface is going to be anatomically reduced. You have to think about that initial x-ray, right? Was there varus deformity? If so, maybe you need a medial buttress where your plate fixation. If there's valgus deformity, maybe you need a lateral buttress. Um, if there's anterior or posterior sort of shearing, then you may need an anterior or posterior buttress. So that initial x-ray can really help you determine where your plate fixation is going to need to go. Right, so this is kind of explaining what we were just talking about. So, you know, for instance, here you're probably going to want to, when, when you get reduction, you want to have an anterior uh, buttress plate here, and then you similar example in all the other cases for their respective plate position. So, we're going to stop here and uh, we'll pick up with surgical approaches and uh, operative techniques and uh, outcomes and complications in the second part of this two-part video. Thanks.